All right, welcome everyone to Performance Analytics Office Hours. Thanks for joining today. If this is your first time here, we're very excited to meet you. Go ahead and let us know in the chat, say hi. And if you've been here before, uh, rest assured, we like you too. Welcome back. Uh, and feel free to also say hi. My name is Tom Pasek. I'm a technical product marketing manager here at ServiceNow. And today we're going to cover dynamic filters um, in this session, but I have a couple things I want to go through uh, before we launch into the content. So for you first timers, if you haven't been here before, the way these sessions work is we uh, kick off with a presentation from our teams. Uh, it might be a deep dive into some specific topic that we've seen a lot of requests around. Uh, might be an area that we're seeing in the field customers tripping up on, or maybe it's just something really great that we think uh, we want to share a little bit more with you. Uh, if you do have ideas on future topics that you would like to hear more about, go ahead and uh, post those in the community. Um, uh, we, uh, we use that feedback to build our agenda for upcoming sessions. Uh, if you have any questions during our presentation, um, please feel free to go ahead and drop those into the Q&A feature of Zoom. Um, and after our, our presentation, we'll come back and um, go through each of those, read them out loud and, and get those answered for you. Um, and then after that, we'll transition into more of an open Q&A where um, if you have any kind of questions, it doesn't have to be related to today's topic, but just performance analytics and reporting in general, um, we'll again use the Zoom Q&A to go through those. So these sessions have grown a bit in size since we started them. So you are all muted um, as you ask your questions and we're going through the answers. Um, there's a chance we might ask you to unmute if we need some clarification, um, in which case just make sure you have your mic ready to go. And we do record all these sessions and you can access all the previous recordings uh, via that bit.ly short link there. It is case sensitive. So keep PA office hours all in lowercase. Uh, you can also find direct links to the individual sessions and uh, write-ups uh, that might include like the deck and additional commentary um, that are linked to the office hours post that's pinned to the top of the uh, community. So lots of uh, great content for you to reference there. If you didn't see last month, we released four free apps to the ServiceNow store to help organizations manage their uh, response to COVID-19. So these are out there in the wild available to all of you to go ahead and download and use, um, whether you're a ServiceNow customer today or a, a brand new customer. Um, so be sure to check those out. There's more details on servicenow.com uh, if you wanna read about um, what each of them does. And um, there's also a little demo video so you can get a feel for exactly what capabilities are included in those. And last item for me, just a reminder, um, coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll be hosting our Knowledge 2020 conference. It is gonna be a completely digital experience. Uh, it is absolutely free to attend. So tell your coworkers, your friends, family, and loved ones, if your children don't have enough schoolwork from their teachers, go ahead and sign them up. They can attend as well. Um, it is going to be spread out over the course of six different weeks of content. So there'll still be spotlight sessions, breakouts where you hear from customers, labs with hands-on content for you, um, the theater sessions for kind of quick bits and we'll have demos available as well. So um, there's gonna be new content coming out every single week uh, through May and early June. So be sure to check that out. And uh, speaking of which one, I'll mention this again at the end, uh, but just before everyone drops off, um, we are going to take a pause on performance analytics office hours through the month of May while knowledge is going on. So we'll pick up again in early June. Uh, I believe it'll be June 3rd. I'll update the post after today's session. Um, so it'll still overlap with knowledge a bit, but uh, I want to make sure that you guys have the time to get into all that uh, fantastic knowledge content. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam today to go through dynamic filters. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so today we're going to talk about dynamic filter options. This is not a new feature, but it's a really underused feature. So we want to go through, um, make sure you're familiar with how you can use it, where you should use it, um, and in some cases where you don't need to use it. So what are they? Dynamic filter options, this is lifted straight from the documentation and you have the, the link here. We'll send out uh, the reference links in here, a couple of things we'll talk about. But it's the ability to, to use the is dynamic feature in the condition builder where you can use what's already out there with existing out of the box um, is dynamics like is dynamic me, but it allows you the ability to write new ones as well and extend the out of the box functionality. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. Let's get into a little bit more. 
the main use case I have for using dynamic filter options is to improve the user experience. That's what we want to do. So we want to get rid of, uh, get rid of really complicated conditions that we'll see sometimes. I want the users to be able to pick what they're looking for. I want them not to have to know, we'll do this, 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 and this, and this, and that, except on Tuesdays, then you gotta choose this other field. I know we've all seen those reports, but to just simply go, I'm looking for incidents that have this and be able to select that. Um, and this is an addition to report, report sources that name those sets, but we'll see some more examples, but I want to use words that the users are familiar with. And it also allows me to create rather complex report conditions dynamically to match the user. I know things about the user. The, the user is logged in. I know their department. I know their CIs. I know who's in their group. I know what groups they're in. Can I change the report to automatically adjust to them more than just, you know, hi, George, right? We want to be able to do more deep things uh, using that. And then it gives developers, uh, I'm including all of you in this, gives you the developers the ability to go beyond standard conditions, beyond standard condition builders or related list conditions that have one dot lock. The data is in the platform. This lets you get the data out and use it. So let's talk about a few cases where we would use it and a few cases we won't um, and go through some com more complex methods for querying. So you, you do have a few options. We're going to talk about them. So you have related list conditions. I think we have talked about these before. Um, we're going to start with that because that's the kind of the easiest way to start. But then we're going to get into scripted filters with inline JavaScript out of the box dynamic filter options and then scripted filters with dynamic filter options. The, we'll, go, we'll go through these. So related list conditions, hopefully you're all using these. In the condition builder, uh, in the report builder, I can just simply say I want a related list condition, which is allowing me to filter on any of the related lists on the form, anything that references that table. So in this case, um, I'm on incident and I wanna look at the incident configuration item. Or sorry, I, I wanna, I want to be able to query on the configuration item what's what's going on. Awesome about this is no developments needed. It is done in the report when you're configuring it. It references the existing ref leverages the existing references that are in the instance. So if I have um, the incident table references the CI table, so I can I can query my incidents based off of the CIs they affect. The cons: you're only allowed one related list con condition per query. That one is enough most of the time, but there are cases where I need to do two things. Um, and it does require the references to be defined. Now, references being defined is generally very good, but there are cases where uh, it's, you may not want that, particularly if you have multiple dot walks. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So there's some limitations, but I always want to start with a related list condition because I don't have to do any extra development. I'm lazy. And if it just works and the users can configure it, this is definitely the best option if it meets my needs. Out of that, uh, next from there, for we have dynamic filter options. So this is where we're starting. You probably have all seen dynamic filter options, but didn't know the name because it's kind of a weird name. Um, but out of the box, we ship with is, is dynamic on some fields and me is the best example. So this means I can put this on a report and the report will run it for whoever's viewing it, me, right? Show me my CI, show me the incidents where I'm the caller. Show me incidents where the assignment group uh, the assignment group's manager is me. It's great because it encapsulates all the logic. However, we figure out how me, who me is, it, it, the users don't have to care. Um, issues with this or, or issues or cons from it is it doesn't accept parameters. So I, I, it's got to be me or I'm the manager. You need to define these things. Um, the out-of-the-box ones are limited to out-of-the-box functionality, and they are configured by the admin. Um, so a, a user can't just add a new one that the admin or developer needs to, needs to configure the, the dynamic filter options. Next is an oldie. I, I generally don't recommend using it, but you might see it. Um, you, you'll see, you might see it in some older plugins and in some other cases. Um, we generally try not to use it, but it's a scripted filter with inline JavaScript. And actually the, the screenshot we have is just inline JavaScript, but this is where you'll see is JavaScript colon some JavaScript. Right. So in this case, we're doing get user ID. So I'm going to get the current user's sys ID. This is the exact equivalent of doing is dynamic me. It has the benefits of it encapsulates the, the logic, right? I can run this, uh, this logic. 
I can accept parameters, which is the kind of the one case I might use this for where in this case, get user ID doesn't have any functions, but I could call a function and give it a parameter. And it, it can be called by a user. This runs in a sandbox, so it is limited on what you can put in um, when you're typing in JavaScript because people can write that. There's the, the, there are security um, controls in place to prevent, to limit what you can do. Um, it requires development in that I have to have these functions. GS is built in, so there's no extra development. But if I wanted to build my own, I would have to build my own. Um, the biggest con of this and the reason we don't use this is it requires knowledge of the script include to be called. You have to know that gs.getUserID exists. There's a docs, uh, the developer site and the API documentations, you can look these up. Um, but as a general user, I wouldn't, wanna want, I wouldn't want one of my users to do this. I would never ask a user to type in JavaScript. I might, particularly if I'm doing a uh, kind of an interesting breakdown source or indicator source. I can use these. That's the one place I will use these. Um, but, but again, I have the user has to type in the JavaScript correctly and they can barely select things correctly. So the idea that they'd have to type this in and particularly if it's more complex is, is pretty much a no-go if, if I'm exposing this to a user. Um, one other note too, when you do an is dynamic me, uh, and I don't have it up here, it'll say where the uh, owned by is Adam Stout if I'm viewing it. When you do the JavaScript, it's just gonna put in the result of the JavaScript, which is a sys ID. It doesn't know that this is a standard sys ID. Um, if you are using this, um, one of the things you'll end up doing is, is doing the owned by dot sys ID. If I was doing this a dynamic filter option, it would be owned by is dynamic, not owned by dot sys ID, but just owned by. Um, in the condition builder, you do have to go straight to the field you're going for. It doesn't know what a reference is, it just is. It just knows you're getting a value from this. So sometimes you have to do an extra dot locker. So, And here we see a scripted filter plus a dynamic filter option. So we're kind of getting the best of both worlds. So this one's not out of box, but it allows me again, not to do owned by dot sys ID, but owned by is dynamic, my employees. I own the logic of what my employees means. Is that direct reports or is that um, end levels of hierarchy? I wrote some JavaScript to determine this. Um, and again, up here, instead of having that ugly sys ID, it knows that owned by is Adam Stout. If this returned multiple, um, is will support a list. So if this returns multiple, then it will still put that in there. Owned by is whoever's coming through here. If I wanted to see my employees, actually in this case, my employee is me. Um, I don't have any employees in this instance. In this instance. Uh, again, doesn't accept parameters. It does require development but these pros are very big pros. I get all the logic on however you determine this um, encapsulated and it is a very simple user experience. Uh, they just have a list of things to pick. My employees, my direct reports, um, you know, my direct reports and their reports if I wanna limit it to two. Uh, my frontline workers, whatever I wanna put in there, I can write that logic if I, if I want to do that. All right, let's get through a couple of examples. So again, I don't want to use these unless I have to. So I'm always going to start with the related list conditions and a related list condition. Uh, the use case here is I'm, I want to create a report on the CI table. I have my CIs with more than one incident. So I'm reporting on the CI table and then I have a related list condition where I say greater than or equal to one. If you haven't used these, um, the, the thing you need to make sure you understand is that if you click on the words greater than one, I have a few other settings and I can say greater than five. I can say none, really powerful. It's gonna again report on the CI table, on the configuration item table, but allow me to filter on CIs that have more than one incident. And that this is active incidents. I could say, show me all the CIs that have more than five incidents in the last 60 days. Very powerful, no coding, no development needed. I can do that on the fly. Users can change it as they feel like it. Next, we have a slight variation. Again, this is where I clicked on it. And all I did was I changed it to no. So I wanted CIs with no outages in the last month that started in the last month. Very simple. But again, you got to click on that link to change those settings. Um, so make sure you do click on that if, depending on what you want to get to. And then um, I'm able to do uh, things like active incidents with no active tasks. So how, how do I have an incident that nobody's, that's not being worked on, right? How many service catalog items with no active tasks? 
helps me do some data cleanup. But again, all I want to get is the incidents. So I'm reporting on incident, but I'm filtering on the tasks associated to it where there are no active tasks. Okay, we're gonna go through, uh, those, were, those were cases where I don't wanna use dynamic filter options because I can do it without them. And again, if you can do it without, do do it without. But now we're gonna give you a walkthrough of what does it take to write a dynamic filter option and actually do what I'm looking for. The first thing that it takes is a script include. So I have a very basic script include here. Um, and again, we'll, we'll post the deck out uh, afterwards, but I have a very basic script include that creates a class uh, called custom reporting filter is not the best name, but great for my example. And get all managers. So I will say I normally recommend that you, we have a manager flag on the sys user field so I can just say manager is true. But if I don't have that, um, I can use this. This logic works fine. I'm defining a manager as anybody who is listed in the manager field. That could be, uh, it could be based on a job code. You could do what, use whatever logic you want. This logic generally works but it is logic that you choose. And what I do is I have my function that I'm gonna call, I'm running a query when this runs, and then I need to push uh, a, an array. My return needs to be an array or a list, a, CS, a CSV or an array of sys IDs. And the examples we're using, we're always gonna return sys IDs. So I get, I look in sys user, I run a glide aggregate to get all the different distinct, all the distinct managers out. I loop through, put them in an array, and return that in an array. To return that array. Um, a key note: when this runs, when we do put these in there, we run this JavaScript. We run the JavaScript for the dynamic filter option. Then we send the results to the database to run the, the main query. So performance does matter, and size does matter too. Um, the database can handle big queries. That's fine. Um, but if I were returning back all users, you know, I was returning back 200,000 users, this effectively, effectively is going to get translated to an in list on the database. So I do want to be wary, uh, aware of that. We don't have URL restrictions because the dynamic filter option is very small, but um, be aware of what you're sending back. We are running this query once, we are getting the results, and then incorporating those results into the query we're going to run the database. Okay, the second thing I do is I register by dynamic filter option. So once I have this, I actually could do my inline JavaScript. I don't want to, but I, I could do that. What I'm gonna do to expose this to my users is create a dynamic filter option. And if you, it requires admin access, but if you go in the, into your menu, you can type in dynamic filter options and this will appear. So in this case, I'm gonna call it managers. And then I call my script. Again, this script runs in a sandbox, so you can't put a lot of logic in here. You can, if I wanted to return a constant of six, I could put that in here, it's just running JavaScript. Generally, what we're gonna see is that this is gonna be, this script is going to call a script include. And as I go back, the big red thing, which I forgot to mention is, it must be client callable. Your script include must be client callable. So I generally have a script include that is just my dynamic filter option, so I don't expose everything as client callable but this script include absolutely needs to be client callable or it will not work. So I, I have my function, I'm calling my new custom, uh, cus, uh, custom reporting filters dot get all managers. So I'm calling one method in that class. I will often have one script include that has multiple methods for the different scripting op, the different option, the different dynamic filter options I wanna use. It is a reference, the field type is a reference. There are other types and this is used for uh, default values and reference qualifiers as well, and you can get some more advanced things. When I'm using them, I'm generally restricting them to available for a filter, the box over on the right, and they're gonna be a reference to that table, to sys user. And what this means is any, refer any report that references sys user, incident caller, problem assigned to, or task assigned to, project, uh, project, project manager, those all reference sys user, and these will now all have the ability to have manager exposed. It's not restricted to project. It's not restricted to task. It's not restricted to demand, to CI. It's based on what it's referencing. We're exposing it everywhere. We can set an order. So the order is in that dropdown of is dynamic. What options do I want to have? And I can have roles. So I can define this so this, only ex this is only exposed to ITIL users. It's only exposed to project managers. 
if it's exposed to project managers, it's exposed whether they're looking at a task table or a project table or a CI, but it's only exposed to project managers. So I generally don't have many that are restricted to roles, but that might make sense for you. If it's something that does not, that only applies to a certain role, go ahead and restrict it. All right, so we, we have our dynamic filter option. We have our, we have our script include, we have our filter option. Um, and I have a question that I don't want to steal my thunder for, so we'll get to it in just a moment. Um, and then I need to use it. So I am now going is assigned to, uh, assigned to again, any, sys, any reference to sys user has is dynamic and then managers. My drop down includes is me, or we have is dynamic me because that comes out of box. And now we have managers. Managers may not be the best term and it's okay, but it's not the best because again, it needs to, you need to convey what exactly you are that you're doing. When I run this in a report, I'm gonna see that list at the top is assigned to, again, it runs the query first, gets that back and then sends it to the database. So I end up with an in list. And I have, in this case, a pretty large in list of all managers. If my organization has 100,000 users and has 10,000, 15,000 managers, this one might not be a great dynamic filter option because that list is gonna be very long and just showing it is, is gonna be quite a bit. But perhaps I do um, managers in my organization, cut that list down quite a bit. So I can script this again, however I wanna script it uh, to get to control the user experience I wanna have. Uh, so a question came in is, can dynamic filters uh, be integrated with interactive filters on a dashboard? Absolutely. The reason we're really talking about this um, is when we were talking about uh, two, uh, two sessions ago, four weeks ago, element filters and dynamic, uh, dynamic PA widgets. I can create a dynamic, fil uh, dynamic filter option that I use for my filter widgets, that I can use my fil element filters, which I use my personalized widgets. I can use these in reports. I can use them in interactive filters. A great case is my interactive filters that has all users, all users in my department. So as a user who logs in to that dashboard, who's viewing that interactive filter, get my department and then get all the users in my department. So somebody from marketing is gonna see a different list than somebody in IT, a different list from somebody in sales. Also, I can use, get people who work for me, right? People who work for me is, is simple because it is just where the manager is dynamic.me. That's out of box. You guys can all do that today, but I could write something more complex. Dynamic filter options are nice on their own, but when you layer them in with the other tools that you have, you have really supportable, really supportable small components that you can tweak the logic for, but really make the entire environment, the entire user experience much more customized, much, more, um, much simpler to use and, and really improve what your users are looking for. Nobody wants to see a list of you know, 10,000 users to pick through. That's it, right? So again, the, the, three, the three things we did are, are create a script include, or we can call GS, we can call out of the box script includes if they exist. We're gonna register the dynamic filter option. The, both of these steps need to be done by the developer or admin. And then using it, anybody can use it. Anybody I gave to the role can use it. So that's all my user needs to know is I have managers. Okay. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, we can pop them in. Otherwise, we're going to move to the next section, which is some variations. So we've done is me. We've talked about that. We've talked about managers, really simple things. We're going to talk about a couple other use cases that we have. So in this case, I have a function called get all. And get all query sys users, either based, this is for example purposes, purposes only. I don't know why you'd actually do this. But I want to get where the first name starts with something. Or I want to get people who have been, uh, been here for um, X number of years, whatever X is going to be. Um, yeah, where I'm going to give it a, a year and then I have a value for years in. And then after I run that query on sys user, it's whatever query I want to send it, whatever I want to have, whatever parameters I want to give it. And then I'm going to create an array of sys IDs and push it into results. And so what I do with this is I have a couple of variations here. I'm using the exact same function in my script include for the first five of these. But what I'm doing is I don't care about the first name, but I want to know everybody who's uh, updated on is more than five years ago. That should be an interesting list. I want to have everybody who's updated on is more than three years ago. I mentioned you, that dynamic filter options don't have parameters. 
But what I'll often do is create dynamic filter options that have the most common. If you think about our date filters, they work the exact same way. We have our relative where you do get parameters, but most of what we see used is on last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. There might be a use case where I want to know who, you know, last updated on the last 50 days, and, and we do support that. But generally, 30, 60, 90 covers most of my use cases. And I'm doing this, I'm taking the same approach here. I want to know users that started three years ago, five years ago. Again, I don't know why you'd want this, but I can do all users whose first name starts with an F, all users who start with an A, or all users. Now, the all users one's a bit dangerous. I probably wouldn't let that out, depending on your size. You know, starting with an F is probably not a great idea. But if I needed things like, give me all of the users with duplicate names, because I'm, I know I have an issue with people getting assigned the wrong ticket. My function can go find people with duplicate names, get those names and return it back to me. I return all the sys IDs of the people with different, with different names. Um, and another, uh, and a question coming in, can I dot lock with these? Can I layer several different conditions? Absolutely, again, if I am looking, uh, we're gonna get to a couple more examples and some more advanced use cases, but the point we wanna get through here is that uh, you're not, it doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. I can have, I can use some parameters. What do my users ask for? And I can build those things. Whether it makes sense to me or not, as long as it makes sense to you and it makes sense to your users, you can define it. And again, the roles, I'm starting to see this caller, right? References to this user. It has a lot of things in here and maybe I want them, maybe I don't. So me, all managers, one of my assignments, some of these come out of the box. These all users are all custom. Unsubmitted timesheets, if you have uh, the timesheet um, application, I think these come with it. They can be rather random things that come through, but when we go to the example of what does my user want and how do I make it easy, unsubmitted time for, timesheets for the current week. That's it, that's what I want. I want users with unsubmitted timesheets for the current week. Un particularly unsubmitted, it's really hard to find but I can write a query to make this very easy for the, for the users to come up with. Okay, and we're gonna talk about a couple other use cases that we have. So, okay, so we've talked about really simple ones. These are some of the ones that aren't, that people don't necessarily think about, but I, I like. So a pre-selection table. Um, I could add, we have owner or supported by on CIs, but I don't wanna have, you know, interested CIs. I may not want to add a field to CI or to task for things that I may just, I may just may not want to add a field to something that's going to get used one in a thousand times. But for CIs, if something's used one in a thousand times, it still might be used thousands of times. So what I did in this situation where I want to have my favorite CIs is I created a custom table called my favorite CIs. I have a module to it. I let users add their CIs. Maybe I have a business rule that populates it like any CI I put an incident in on. I, however you want to populate it or let them add and remove things to that list. I have a normal standard. I have a normal table. I let, I let them manage it. I have business rule to manage it, whatever I want to do. But my dynamic filter option allows me to say, query that list and put that list in. This is a great option. When you see those lists that people have listed um, a thousand uh, PRBs that they want to track the status on, one, they can probably watch it, but I can, I can have a dynamic filter option that just says, it's one of these things. It, it's one of these. In the example report, just configuration item is dynamic one of these. So I'm on incidents, but I wanna know, give me any ones that are in the CI uh, that are in my favorite list. You can also use this if you wanna exclude things. So I'll see it for PRBs, like there's some special PRBs that we don't count, that we as an organization have agreed would match normally our criteria, but we don't count them. Ideally, I would add a flag to say this is excluded. But if I wasn't, I might have a table that just says exclude these. These have been approved to be excluded from our quarterly reports. Instead of typing them in, having in my reports all the time, maybe I'll put them on a report source, but I can also have a table that audits that, right? That audits my exception list. And my reports just say, ignore anything in the, in the exception list. Complex, all right, so in this case, what I wanna have, this is a bit weird again, but to prove the point, I know who you are, I know what CIs you have, I know what models those CIs are. So I'm gonna run a query where I wanna know all the active incidents that are on CIs that have the same model as CIs that I own. That's a lot of dot walking, looking related list conditions, a lot of stuff going on there, 
but I, if that's something that's common that my users ask for, I need to put it on a dashboard, I can write that logic in a script include and I can expose it as the dy dynamic filter option. So where the configuration item has the same model as one I own. And here I wanna do multiple dot walking. This would be one where I'd want a related list condition on a related list condition, which is, which is not supported, but I can effectively do that here. So I've written a script include that has a function that says, give me all the PRB tasks assigned to people where the manager is me. So I'm using a scripted filter of is me at the, at the bottom of it, but I'm returning all of the PRBs that have tasks. So that would be simple that I could do with a related list condition. But now since I want the incidents with those PRBs, I need to use this, this um, complex or this dynamic filter option. Again, I can do whatever I needed to do. Remembering it's got to still run the query, but I can get that result back, make this much easier for my, my users. I now have a simple report. I might put this in a report source, have a dashboard that's based all of this, on all of this, um, end user in mind with what I want to get to. And again, this lets me do something I wouldn't otherwise do because what I'm actually counting is incidents, but I need to get those, but I need to get the data from two levels down. Um, in all these examples, I realize I actually am using fields on the incident table. That's fine. You can dot walk. Anytime it references sys user, if you look at is me, you could do where the, I want incidents where the assignment groups, managers, department head is me. These all work the same. There's, you actually can't limit it. Um, so when you say this is available for this role or for all roles on this, when it references this table, any way you could dot walk to it, this is supported. All right, a couple key points as we wrap up. So you're, you, when you write your script include, this, this gets me every time, it's a little hard to debug. Make sure that your script include is, there's a checkbox for client callable. Make sure you make, it call, make that script include client, call, client callable. The dynamic filter options run in a sandbox, um, just like inline JavaScript does. So you're limited on what you can do there. Effectively, it means you're always gonna wanna call a script include. Several years ago, you could do a lot in line JavaScript, but that we've added additional security. So by making it, by forcing you to put it in a script include, it means users are very limited on what they can do directly. But as an admin, you can do whatever you need to do. As a developer, you can do whatever you need to do. So this gives us security and flexibility by, put, by forcing things to go through change control. So very, done very much on purpose for your benefit. And I'm telling you that in case you curse at me because it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it is. This is, this is a really good design. Um, it can be used in interactive, uh, in indicator sources, in breakdown sources, in elements filters, in interactive filters. I encourage you to use it in all of those things. This can be really good to support what you want to get to. Um, I, I know a question came up recently about interactive uh, inter indicator sources. If I have all my indicators filtering out data, and my indicator source returns more data than it should, my records get, can, can get a little bit weird on what comes in. By using this, I can put incredibly complex logic into my indicator source so that only relevant records come back. And again, breakdown sources are the same thing. I only want to, I only want to see breakdown, the breakdown values that actually can apply through these complex situations. So these are there for you for interact, uh, indicator sources, breakdown sources, interact uh, elements filters and interactive filters. Any place there's a condition builder, you can use these. Um, a note though, with the indicator sources, since we're on a PA conversation, with indicator sources, is me doesn't work because is me is the user running the job. So be, you can use dynamic filter options, but make sure you're not using personalized dynamic filter options. No, um, my reports, no um, is me, but you can use people who are managers. You can do incidents, uh, in, uh, CIs that have incidents, active incidents on them. Those are fine. We execute that JavaScript to make sure you're not personalizing because it's going to personalize to the job, to the user that's running the job. These can be used in an application. I recommend you put them in applications. Um, the one note, reason I have the star here, is that dynamic filter options need to be in the same scope as the table. So if I want to put a dynamic filter option on sys user, I have to be in global. If I want to put a dynamic filter option on um, uh, uh, CSM uh, on case, 
I need to be in that application. But if you're build, as you're building your applications, you're building custom tables, you can add dynamic filter options that will ship with it. It doesn't have to be done afterwards. It's great to go with it. Um, and as the example we saw, you can call the same function multiple times with different parameters. That allows me to have a um, very small amount of code that I don't, that might go through its change review and, and has more uh, diligent change controls. But my dynamic filter options, I can give it with additional parameters. And again, when I'm using an indicator source, since users aren't gonna see that, that would be the one use case where I might give it more, or I might actually do inline JavaScript, not register a dynamic filter option, but allow me to put the parameters into my indicator source, my breakdown source, my elements filters, my interactive, my interactive filters. Because users don't see those, I might use inline JavaScript, but if my users are ever gonna see them, I'm certainly gonna just create multiple with those parameters, the 30 days, 60 days type of thing, and expose them to my users. Okay, and wrapping up, um, there is documentation on all this. So a couple things, there's the links to dynamic filter options. There's links to writing script includes. I know that can be daunting for the first one we have to write. Um, and then there's a blog post um, from a couple of years ago that has a lot of these examples in it. it walks you through um, with some more screenshots about what those forms look like, some sample code uh, to get you started. So I recommend hitting that up as well. Uh, but we wanted to talk through those. And if you have any questions, um, I'm always in the community. So just feel free to tag me in the community, post it. Lots of great people who can answer your questions um, for you. But if you want to draw my attention to it while I read most of them, you can feel free to tag me. Um, I believe you just do um, at Adam Stout and I will get an alert that you tagged me in your question. So now we can open it up to any questions about dynamic filter options um, or any of the stuff we covered here. Um, and then anything else that you have any questions about. So if there is, if there is nothing more, hopefully we answered them. Um, oh, question came in. Uh, so if you can throw them into the Q and A window, I don't know if anything's coming in on chat, uh, but feel, go ahead and, and ask anything you want. Um, and since there's not a rush on the dynamic filter options, we'll answer anything uh, PA reporting dashboard related that we can. Okay, a couple questions coming in. Uh, can dynamic, can dynamic filter filters be used in automated indicators? Yes, they, they can. But again, they, they run as the users that the job is running as. So you got to remember that. Um, PA, the indicator itself, bypasses ACLs. But when you run a dynamic filter option, that is why we have the user specified on the job. It, the scripts, which these are effectively, the PA scripts, but also the dynamic filter option scripts or inline JavaScript run as that user. So if they're running as performance analytics and I wanna say, you know, give me my users, you get nothing back. So that, that can be a source of frustration. So you can use them, but again, don't, don't use personalized ones that rely on the user. When you wanna do that, you're gonna run the indicator source as normal, but your breakdown source is gonna be just me. Also very, very useful if you're using element security. Element security would, would be only let me see people who work for me work in my organization, that's where I'm going to use, uh, I'm also going to use dynamic filters there that are personalized. But in PA, if you do need to personalize, use that in the elements filters, not in the indicator source. Okay, uh, now they're flowing in. All right, uh, question coming in about, um, would you recommend creating a breakdown group on group types? For example, group type includes um, ITIL, project managers, whatever the types are. Um, if, that, if that's useful to you, I, I, that's fine. The group types are um, a group type on, I'm assuming this is on sysuser group, is a list which should break down naturally. So you, there is a table that contains all the groups or it's, it's either syschoice or it's a reference. I, I don't recall off the top of my head, um, but you'll set that breakdown source up as normal. You break down on, um, uh, like incidents dot assignment group dot group type, and you should have that that breakdown. Um, if you're using types and that's useful, then more power to you. Um, and if you're not, then then it wouldn't matter. But it it certainly will support it. Uh, should be pretty easy to set up. Interesting one it coming in. Can we pull the tickets in the assignment groups where that were closed with no PRB associated for a specific time? So I think that means do I want to have the 
in incidents that were closed with no PRB. Um, yeah, it, now there's a couple options in that. So I think you, you, you should be able to do that with the related list where I would just say, give me all the incident, yeah, give me all the incidents um, where there where PR, where PRB is empty. Um, yeah, you, you should be able to do that. It depends on how you organize things, whether you have an M to M or not, but using a related list condition, I think you'd be able to do that, um, whether you're in PA or reporting. Um, if you have that, I need to see a little bit more examples of. So if, you, if you're having problems with it, um, with how you configure report to get what you're looking for, I'd recommend taking a couple of screenshots of what you sent um, what you've set up um, and post those in the community and get some feedback about how you might adjust that. But I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to. Um, and a follow-up, which is a <laughs> thank you for following up about the group assignments breakdown. If you're putting tier one, tier two, tier three into your groups, uh, your group type, then certainly it makes sense to, to go, how many incidents do I have um, by tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, I also might look at SLA breakdowns by that and really understand is my is my process different between those things? Um, putting metrics with those would be pretty interesting as well. So if you start, if you're starting to roll things up, that makes sense. If you use group types, if you're using a hierarchy, that might be something else you'd want to do. I mean, you could dot walk up into, or you can traverse the hierarchy up into that. Um, but certainly, grouping your incidents into tier one, uh, into a tier, makes sense. Are there specific, uh, really good question. Are there specific uh, considerations for using related list conditions or best practices? We don't have a lot of best practices because it's limited on what you can do, which, which it's certainly just getting the references that you're pulling back. Um, the, the one best practice I have or the one consideration is, uh, is that it left joins to the data. So it supports the one or more or no. Uh, the logic's all the same in there. Um, so you got to be careful on the main table. The related list condition is fine. It's generally going to run very quickly. Um, it's going to run as fast as it can. I'll, actually, I'll put it that way. So if you're scanning task for incidents closed or for tasks closed in the last, um, if you're scanning task in the related list condition without on a non-indexed field, it's got to scan task on a non-indexed field. So that, that can be cautious. So make sure in your related list conditions that you do follow an indexed field like things assigned to me, active is true. Um, if uh, last updated is there, um, everything you would do to turn, turn a, tune a normal report, you'd wanna make sure you're tuning in your related list condition as well. Because again, if it has to scan, um, if I wanna get my incidents or whatever it is in the main query, but the related list condition is really slow, we have to run that, that query is run too. So be aware of that. And then the one gotcha that I've run into is if you can filter your main query as well, tune that query as well. Because if I'm looking for like incidents, uh, my incidents or, or something that comes through, um, if the main query doesn't have any filters, it has to run that full table scan as well. So be aware that you want to tune both the related list conditions and the reports, uh, tune them. They, they don't tune well together. You kind of need to tune them separately, make sure they're both good and then you'll be fine. But if either one is bad, you can kind of go sideways. And a, another uh, higher level question about uh, positioning per, uh, performance analytics to, to the C level and how do you how do you stack it up? How do you how do you show the value of PA? Tom, are you still on? Do you want to talk about that one and are the resources we have? Yeah, I'm still here. Um... Yeah, so on that, um, I can dig up some links. We definitely have plenty of material that'll help kind of highlight the um, some of the differences there from maybe a, like a traditional BI product, if that's what you're looking to compare it against. Um, so that was Annabelle, looks like. Let me, um, Annabelle, I'll follow up with you offline and we can connect on those items. Um, and there is uh, there are some things in the, in the uh, Customer Success Center that might help as well. Yep. But uh, it... And if you're looking for that, Tom will send some materials. You can also talk to your, your account executive. They can get you some of that stuff, but there certainly is a, uh, a lot of what we're presenting is to make sense to you and, and people who are buying things, but we want to get to the C level and we want to up level things. Um, there, are, there is content out there to help them. So we just, we'll help you find it. Okay. 
All right. So a question came in that is long and I'm going to read it and see if we can, we can answer it in the last next couple of minutes. Um, is it possible on my dashboard to create a list of dynamic filter options, display a list of labels from the dynamic filter options as a drop down on the interactive filter, and then have the script from the label apply to the reports? Yes. Yes, you could do that. Um, you, it, that does not come out of box. You'd have to create a custom filter to do it, a custom interactive filter to do it. It is doable. Um, I wouldn't, the interactive filters allow you to suggest it. I mean, I, and I see some, some value in that, but um, uh, you'd have to be basically re-implementing part of the condition builder to do that. So in terms of which roles can see it, um, and then actually that the mapping on the fly would be a challenge. So it can kind of be done, but it would be rather challenging. You'd have to still tell it what fields you're gonna support this on. Um, so I don't know that I would do that. Um, and as far as combining them, um, at, at the end of the day, well, one of the things that I've done is a custom filter that I that we it does it's not supported out of box. We do support dynamic filter uh, dynamic filter options in interactive filters to to control the list of values that come in. That's the standard practice. So I'm going to do where um, I have an interactive filter on sys user, and I just say show me the users in here where the manager is me. That, that's supported, highly encouraged. But um, I have used cases where I have a custom interactive filter that applies dynamic filters, which is something to what you're talking about um, where you can do it. And you, if you do a custom filter, you could have it pick two dynamic filters. You can have it do whatever you want it to do. Um, you could have it parameterize the filters by creating a custom interactive filter. The custom interactive filters, we've done presentations on those in the past. If you wanna go back in the past office hours, they're useful when you need them, but if you can avoid them, avoid them because they are custom code. Um, and, and it's especially when you get into custom UI stuff, there's more things that can break and interactions. When we're using dynamic filter options, we are writing custom script includes, but that when you're talking about server side logic, it is much more contained. It's much easier to, to um, write automated tests on. So the dynamic, the scripted filters we talked about, when you write them, you should write um, tests in the automated test framework to get them to work. You can, you can verify they work, they continue to work through all upgrades and it's not an, much of an additional burden. But when you start doing custom interactive filters, it's just harder to test. Um, so if it's a make or break, you certainly can do it um, because all you're gonna do, you're, when you're, if you're using an interactive filter and you'll see it if you do an is me, if you copy the breadcrumbs, it copies, uh, there's an operator called dynamic and it tells the system to go back into the database and run it. Um, you can go see what those queries are. If you wanna create a custom interactive filter with a dynamic filter option, uh, very doable. Um, you just need to create that query string like you would for any other custom interactive filter. Okay, I think we have answered all the questions. Um, we have a couple minutes left if anybody has anything else. Um, but if not, we can give you a few minutes back uh, to digest what we talked about. Um, again, this will get posted um, in the next couple of days to YouTube. And we'll put, when it gets posted there, we'll post it in the community as well with the deck and the links for you to access. Um, and I, I highly recommend you, you keep this in your back pocket because um, when you need it, you need it. And it is incredibly powerful for you uh, to really make sure you squeeze out all the value you can for your users. All right, Tom, any parting words for our friends? Yeah, thanks everyone for attending and for the good questions here. Uh, just a reminder, we're going to pause new sessions for about a month here and we'll pick up with the next session on June 3rd. So see you then. Take care.